Hey, hi everyone. So just to um, say hello as a quick introduction. So welcome to the webinar today, which is part of the World Transplant Games Federation Research Initiative. Um, so my name is Gareth Wiltshire. I'm a senior lecturer at Loughborough University in the UK, and I'm the co-chair of the research initiative, along with Anders Bilstrom. So uh, as the initiative is quite new, it's worth me saying that what we're doing with this initiative um, on behalf of the World Transplant Games Federation is trying to support the growth of research in sport, exercise and health for organ and tissue transplant recipients by harnessing the synergies between the World Transplant Games Federation, its partners, member nations and the global network of researchers working in this area. So we've got a number of different ideas and, and things to do, but this webinar is part of a, a series of webinars that we want to put on every couple of months to help start moving um, uh, and generating ideas within the community for anyone interested. Um, and we are very, very lucky today to be joined uh, by Dr. Manuela uh, de Paula Ferreira. And she is um, talking to us today from Canada. So Dr. Ferreira is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, working with Dr. Sunita Mather since 2019, uh, and in the area of frailty and sarcopenia in solid organ transplant candidates and recipients. Interestingly, I think she's a qualified physiotherapist and has a bachelor's degree in dance, as well as master's and PhDs in uh, physical education from Brazil. And that's where she studied the effects of home-based exercise on, um, uh, on home-based dance exercise programs in people with Parkinson's disease. So um, Manuela is uh, interested in making home-based exercise programs accessible and feasible for people with functional mobility restrictions. So hopefully I got most of that okay, but I'll, uh, if so, I'll, I'll hand over to you and I'm gonna talk for um, you know, roughly roughly half an hour, but, but no one's got a, got a stopwatch on. Um, and then we'll have uh, time to, to ask questions at the end. So over to you, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, World Transplant Games Federation for the invitation. I am very excited to be here. And um, especially because I will be presenting the approach to evaluating and defining sarcopenia in solid organ transplant, some preliminary results from the FROST study. And actually, this is my first study uh, here in Canada, outside Brazil. And before starting, I would like to acknowledge uh, my country, Brazil, and especially the Federal University of Paraná, the university from where I got my bachelor's degree in physiotherapy, my master's and my PhD. Uh, as well, I'd like to acknowledge the University of Toronto and uh, Dr. Sunita Matur, who is my supervisor and who is uh, guiding me through my postdoc. So we have, oh, sorry. We have no disclosures for today's presentation, and I have uh, another few acknowledgements. So first to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, because we are funded by them. And also we would like to acknowledge the exceptional support of our co-principal investigators, Dr. Leanne Singer and Dr. Sunita Matur, as well as co-investigators, collaborators that we have under the FROST study and our study coordinator, which is an amazing person and keeps on track everything we do. And uh, all our research assistants and other coordinators that support us with our lab um, tests and data analysis. So for today, I will talk a little bit about sarcopenia and solid organ transplantation and the relationship between sarcopenia and solid organ transplantation, as well about the FROST study and the preliminary results we have that are how ultrasound can predict sarcopenia in lung transplant candidates, the prevalence of sarcopenia before and after lung transplantation, feasibility of a virtual assessment for physical frailty in solid organ transplant recipients. And at the end, I will bring some take home messages and some future directions. So sarcopenia is a muscle disease, a muscle failure that is confirmed in the presence of low muscle strength and low muscle quantity or quality. And also sarcopenia is considered severe when low physical performance is also present. Sarcopenia 
years ago was understood as a disease more related with, with aging, but now we know that sarcopenia is present even in early ages, and probably it is happening because of chronic diseases. In this reality, we include the solid organ transplant patients, either heart, liver, kidney, or liver patients. And what do you know about the sarcopenia in solid organ transplantations? So we know that sarcopenia is associated with poor clinical outcomes in solid organ transplantation, especially is associated with decreased post-transplant survival in heart, liver, and lung and kidney patients, as well greater risk of infection for liver, increased risk of graft loss for kidney, and longer hospital length of stay for heart, lung, and kidney patients. But it's important to let you know that the measurement of sarcopenia for solid organ transplantation is usually based on the muscle quantity assessment. And there is a huge variety of ways to measure muscle quantity. So we still without a cutoff or a guidance uh, related to what is the best way to measure muscle quantity in solid organ transplantation. Uh, so these ideas bring us some research questions that are how to measure sarcopenia in solid organ transplantation. What is the best cutoff for sarcopenia to guide diagnosis and clinical outcomes in solid organ transplantation? And finally, how to best evaluate the relationship between sarcopenia and clinical outcomes in solid organ transplantation? With these questions, we go to the FROST study, which is the frailty and sarcopenia in organ transplantation study. This study had Dr. Leanne Singer and Sunita Matura as co-PIs, and it was a connection between the University Health Network and University of Toronto in Canada. This is a single century prospective study in solid organ transplant candidates. And we conducted measurements of sarcopenia and frailty before transplant three and 12 months after transplantation. We also observed post-transplant outcomes such as weight list mortality, delisting, hospital length of stay, health-related quality of life. And for inclusion, we had uh, adults 18 years of age and older on active waiting list for kidney, liver, heart, and lung transplantation. And now I will present you some of our preliminary results. Starting by the first problem. So skeletal muscle quantity is the most common sarcopenia measurement in solid organ transplantation. But how to measure skeletal muscle quantity in our patients? Well, we have dual energy X-ray absorptiometry DEXA, or we have the bioelectrical impedance analysis, abdominal lumbar thoracic, or mid-thigh muscle cross-sectional area by the CT scan or MRI. And we also can measure muscle quality by biopsy. Although these equipments are very high cost and they are time consuming, sometimes they have radiation exposure. And if you are not in the big centers, you will probably not have access to this type of tools. So an alternative way to measure muscle quantity and quality that is simpler, cheaper, and it is portable is the ultrasound. And uh, better than this, ultrasound can be used in different settings. So for either clinical or research field. This idea leads us to the first FROST study, which is how ultrasound can predict sarcopenia in lung transplant candidates. Our objectives were to develop a regression-based model to predict a particular lean mass index from DEXA using ultrasonography and to determine the most parsimonious model from ultrasound to predict a particular lean mass index. Understanding here the most parsimonious model as the model that had the ultrasound model with less muscles and with the participant in the supine position. So basically the parsimonious model for us uh, was considered the simple model where we were looking for less muscles and the participant only had to stay in the supine position. And as the third objective, we uh, were trying to develop or to determine the cut point for low appendicular muscle mass using the most parsimonious ultrasound model. 
So this was a prospective study and the participants underwent a DEXA scan from where we collect appendicular lymphs index. And also participants uh, performed a, a ultrasound test. The ultrasound was done in the dominant leg and the, low, uh, and the participants told us which one of the legs were the dominant leg based on the question, with which leg do you kick a ball? And the muscles that were assessed were rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, gastrocnemius, and tibialis anterior. So in the bottom of the image, you can see an image from the thickness of the rectus femoris and vastus intermedius. And here at the top, you can see the subcutaneous fat tissue. And in the middle of the image, you can see the tibialis anterior cross-sectional area, as well as the rectus femoris cross-sectional area. We had 61 lung transplant uh, candidates uh, in our study, and uh, the median of age was 63 years old, and 52% were female. And 48% uh, uh, of our um, sample had interstitial lung disease. And uh, more than 50% of either female and male had low appendicular lymph index, which means low muscle quantity, based on the sarcopenia cut point. So after this, we built three multilinear regression models to predict appendicular lymph index. And the three models we built were strongly associated with appendicular lymph index, remembering that it means low muscle quantity. So the first model we built had all the muscles that we, uh, we assessed. So all the quadriceps thickness, gastrocnemius, tibialis anterior, and sex. And the participant had to be in supine and in the lateral position. The second model had all the quadriceps measurements plus tibialis anterior and the sex, and participant was only in supine position. So we removed the gastrocnemius thickness from this model. And the third model had rectus femoris, so from the quadriceps and tibialis anterior plus sex. Again, participant was only supine position. Based on our criteria for the most parsimonious model, the third model was the chosen one um, to develop the cut point for muscle size using ultrasound. So to determine the cut point for muscle size using ultrasound, we did a receiver operating characteristic, the rock curve analysis. So on the left, you can see the rock curve for females. And on the right, you see the rock curve for females. The cut point for low muscle size in females is equal or below 0 0.257 centimeters square. And for males is equal or below 0 0.294 centimeters square. In conclusions, lower limb muscle ultrasound can be used to diagnose low appendicular limb mass in lung transplant candidates using as few as two muscles. This method may be applicable in clinical research settings to evaluate appendicular limb mass. And with ultrasound, more people can be tested and it will be costless. So going to our second problem, the relationship between skeletal muscle strength and clinical outcomes has not been broadly investigated in solid organ transplant patients. But how can we measure muscle strength? So we can measure it through simple questionnaire. So for example, through the SARCF and the EASH screen tool, and we can measure it through the grip strength, uh, which is the most common instrument to measure strength in our population, or the chair stand test as well. And we also have some sarcopenia consensus definitions, but none of the consensus are designed specifically for solid organ transplant patients. And talking a little bit about the consensus definitions, uh, I would like to, to introduce you three 
of, of them. So first, we have the European Working Group for Sarcopenia in Older People. This is the most common sarcopenia definitions, and they include on their definition muscle strength, muscle quantity or quality, and physical performance. The second uh, sarcopenia definitions that I want to talk a little is the sarcopenia definition and outcomes consortium. This uh, sarcopenia, it's much simpler once a muscle quantity is not accessed here, and we only measure muscle strength and physical performance. And as a third example, we have the Asian Working Group for Sarcopenia, which is similar to the European Working Group, uh, working group uh, although they have a slight high grip strength cut point. So knowing this, I'd like to tell you at the sarcopenia definitions interpretation because we use it, those interpretations in our second study. So the European consensus for sarcopenia consider as a severely sarcopenic, the person that has low muscle strength, low muscle mass, and low muscle function. And as, sarco as sarcopenic, the person that has low strength and low muscle mass. Pre-sarcopenic as the person that has low muscle strength and no sarcopenic, the person that doesn't match any of the criteria. And the consortium definition says that a sarcopenic person is the person that has low muscle strength and low muscle function. And the person that doesn't match any of the strength or function cut points is a non-sarcopenic person. So it leads us to the second FROST study, which is the prevalence of sarcopenia before and after lung transplantation. Our objectives were to estimate the prevalence of sarcopenia and lung transplant candidates using the European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People and the Sarcopenia Definitions and Outcomes Consortium, and to estimate the prevalence of sarcopenia three months post lung transplantation using the consortium definition and to compare muscle strength and function in females and males pre and three months after lung transplantation. So this is again a prospective study and the participants and there went two assessments, one before transplantation and the second one three months after transplantation. At baseline before transplant, participants underwent a DEXA scan and at, at baseline and three months after transplant, Participants um, underwent a hand grip test as a measurement of muscle strength and a gait speed as a measurement of physical performance. 62 lung transplants were included and the median of age was 63 years old. 52% of our uh, sample were female and 48% had interstitial lung disease. So as a result, so first we will talk about the sarcopenia pre-transplant and three months post lung transplantation. And as you can observe, we have the European consensus of sarcopenia, the consortium consensus for sarcopenia at the baseline and three months post-transplantation. As pre-sarcopenic, only four people were, were characterized, but we can see that three people were characterized as sarcopenic based on the a European Working Group Consensus for Sarcopenia, and six based on the consortium definition at baseline, and five three months post lung transplantation. And only one person had severely sarcopenia. Now looking at the bottom of the table, we can see the sarcopenia components isolated. So first looking at the low muscle strength, we can see that May, much more patients were classified uh, with low muscle strength based on the consortium definition for sarcopenia at baseline and three months post-transplantation. And that at baseline, 50% of our sample had low muscle mass, showing that probably muscle mass and muscle strength are representative in our population. And now comparing before transplant and after transplant weakness and functional performance. What we can see first 
Um, this is the females group. We had uh, 27 females and 28 males. First, looking at the body mass index, we had no difference between pre and three months post-transplantation between the two groups. Although muscle strength was lower for both females and males three months post-transplantation, which means our patients uh, were weaker after three months after transplantation. And only females were able to improve their functional performance at three months after transplantation. Males, they, uh, uh, our males group, they didn't improve, but uh, at, at the other hand, they still with the same range of physical performance. So in conclusions for this study, low muscle mass based on the European consensus of sarcopenia was frequent amongst lung transplant candidates. The consortium definition for sarcopenia classified more lung transplant candidates as sarcopenic than the European working group based on the hand grip, uh, sorry, uh, hand grip strength cut point. Future studies are needed to determine how the sarcopenia components are related to pre and post transplant clinical outcomes. And now we will talk about our third problem, which is COVID. So in 2020, we were in the middle of our data collection, especially assessing our patients after transplantation. And as you knew before, we were looking for patients at baseline. So which means between four to six weeks after being listed for the transplant. And we were following these patients three months after transplantation and then 12 months after transplantation. So in March, 2020, we had to stop our data collection and we started losing data as well. And we could not go back to an in-person assessment or virtual assessment at that time. So between March, 2020 to June, 2020, we were thinking what we are gonna do. We need to shift from in-person to virtual assessment. Understanding that we had a big problem because our study was designed for an in-person assessment, not virtual. So then we had to figure it out what we could make. So for our data collection, we searched for instruments that we could be we could use in the virtual assessment that were safe for our patients. Understanding here that in 2020, we had no much data about virtual assessments. So as, uh, as some tools to measure functional performance, we had the four meter gate speed, short physical performance battery test, which is one of the FROST instruments, time at up and go, and 400 meter walking test, which is kind of complicated to be done in a video call, right? So because we had the short physical performance battery test already, uh, already set in our, our study, we thought, let's do the short physical performance battery in a video call. And also it's important to, to say that the short physical performance battery has a cut point for sarcopenia, which is equal or below eight. So this brings us to the third study that I will be presenting today. And this study is the feasibility of a virtual assessment for physical frailty in solid organ transplant recipients. Our objectives were to describe the feasibility of a virtual assessment of frailty in solid organ transplant recipients using a modified fridge frailty index and the short physical performance battery, and to describe the prevalence of frailty in solid organ transplant recipients using these measurements. So this is a secondary analysis of a perspective studying adult solid organ transplant recipients. The assessments were performed between July 2020 to April 2021. And as instruments, we had the short physical performance battery and the modified freed frailty index that were performed with patients at three and 12 months after transplantation. And to perform the video call, we made a call using the, the micro, uh, Microsoft Teams. 
So looking at the picture, so first we called all our um, participants and we explained them the shift from an in-person to a virtual assessment. And in case they accepted, we emailed them an e-questionnaire. And in this e-questionnaire, we had two questions for the frailty Fried index exhaustion. We had the duck activity status index as a measurement for low activity. And we also had the self-report weight loss for the shrinking. Additionally, to the e-questionnaire, we sent a video demonstration uh, to our patients from where they could see how to perform the short physical performance battery from home, what are the instruments that they had to set, for example, a chair, a measuring tape, or a shoe to mark the floor. And after that, we booked the video call. In the video call, that was the last um, step from the, the virtual assessment, we started by the short physical performance battery test. So from the balance test to the gate speed, finishing with the five times seat to stand test. Then we asked our participants, do you have difficulty in open a jar of jam or a jar of something else that has never been opened? And this question was a substitutive to the weakness because for the freed, we usually use the hand grip test, but we couldn't send a hand grip dynamometer to our participants. So that is why our freed is a modifier. And uh, for his slowness, his lowness, we use it the, high, the highest short physical performance uh, gate speed. In terms of stratification, the short physical performance battery has a cut point for frailty, which is uh, slightly different than the, the sarcopenia cut point, which is um, equal or below nine. And the freed frailty index has three scores. Like no frail is a person that has zero as a score. Free frail is a person that has scores between one to two. And frail is a person that has a score between three to five. 38 virtual assessments were performed. And the video call had a median duration of 12 minutes, which, which is fast. Um, a support person was present in 68% of the assessments and there were no adverse events. And the virtual assessment was easy to set up and participants felt confident performing the functional test virtually. And actually the paper about this study will be available in June, 2022. So I will send you the link later on. In terms of our population, so the median of age was 61 years old for three months post-transplantation and 60 for 12 months post-transplantation. The body mass index was higher at 12 months of the transplant and we have much more people for the lung growth. In terms of the prevalence of frailty in solid organ transplantation, using the modified freed frailty index, 12% of our population were frail three months after transplantation, and none of them were frail 12 months after transplantation. Although 57% of our participants were pre-frail three months post-transplant, and 42% were pre-frail at 12 months of transplantation. So pre-frailty is still uh, present 12 months after transplantation. And it is usually because of weakness and because of a tiredness. Short physical performance battery uh, showed us that 17% 17 of our participants were frail at, 12, at three months of the transplantation and 10% of our participants were frail 12 months after transplantation. So in conclusions, the virtual assessment for frailty in solid organ transplant recipients was feasible and safe. And the prevalence of frailty was lower at 12 months compared to three months post-transplantation. In conclusion, uh, and some take home messages, virtual assessment of frailty in solid organ recipients is feasible and efficient. Low muscle mass is common in lung transplant candidates and weakness is still present three months post-transplantation. 
ultrasound can predict muscle size from DEXA in a simpler and fast lower limb technique and some future directions. How to measure sarcopenia in a virtual and in-person assessment in solid organ transplantation? How to reduce sarcopenia before transplant? And what are the benefits of it? And is strength or its combination with muscle mass better than muscle mass only to predict clinical outcomes in solid organ transplantation? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. In the absence of um, uh, being in person, I'll give you a, a one person applause uh, just to finish off. So thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. Okay. Really enjoyable. It's not my area at all, uh, speaking personally, and, and I was able to, to follow it. So you did very well to, for, for communication, which is perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite people to, um, to um, ask questions. You can either put them in the chat or you can, you can raise your hand and, um, and ask questions uh, yourself. But I think just to kind of get things kicked off, um, I'll, I'll start with, with the first question. And that is, um, um, it was really interesting to, to hear everyone's story about how to deal with the COVID context and I think everyone's there's a, there's a kind of mutual respect for, for everyone who's managed to continue to, to do actual data collection through it so um, that was amazing but what I'm interested in is would you actually if you if you could choose would you actually continue to use some of those online and virtual measurements going forward or was some of them do you think um, you know we managed to just cope with it and that was fine but ideally, I, I wouldn't do it in future. So, so what would, if anything, would you would you take anything forward in future? Well, great question. Um, honestly, I think the virtual rehabilitation or the tele rehabilitation it's necessarily since um, since beginning of rehabilitation because we have many patients that living far from the the big centres. So it's just unfair to offer to our patients only in-person assessment. Because thinking about our patients with uh, mobility impairments, they always need another person to be with them to help them going to the rehabilitation. And usually we need to work to pay our bills. So how to work, manage rehabilitation, manage the daily family routine. So yes, I think like a, a hybrid system, something that has in-person and virtual is the best, either for clinical reality uh, and for research. And I think it's fair for our patients to be able to choose if they want to do in-person or um, virtual. Of course, sometimes we need to see the patient in person, especially let's say if we want to measure muscle quantity, Right now, we don't have a tool to measure it remotely. We need to see the person. But as we showed in the presentation, we have some consensus definitions for sarcopenia, for example, that can be done remotely and do not require muscle quantity measurement. So I think um, we can keep going with the virtual rehabilitation because uh, we can grow this knowledge and we can develop ways to make the rehabilitation fully accessible for patients that cannot go to an in-person visit. Um, and yes, yeah, since COVID, I have this idea about home visit, like my PhD uh, was, before, was done before COVID and I was working with home visit exercise for Parkinson's disease. Because as you know, Parkinson's is a neurological disease. So patients need to do rehabilitation for a long period of time. And many of them cannot go to rehabilitation because, of they, don't, because they don't have a caregiver or because it's out of reach. It's too expensive. So why not offer them home based? And I think COVID just uh, showed us that this is the reality that we need to work on. And it, I think it's important to keep keep developing it. We cannot just leave it behind. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's a really good answer. You know, I think the idea of a hybrid approach uh, and also taking in people's preferences 
Um, but I really love the idea of also being conscious of inequalities and, and people who are, uh, find it difficult to access in-person sessions. So really, really good point. I have a question from Maria who says, um, in all the studies performed, have you controlled for immunosuppression medication? How many medications um, have patients made? Great question. So honestly, I don't know how many medications our patients are taking. What I know for sure is that in the first year after transplantation, they take a lot of medications that are being reduced after the first year of the transplant. And usually the patients do well with the medication. They Before transplant, they have a lot of meetings with doctors, nurses, and the pharmaceutical group to guide them through the medication. But it's commonly between our population to hear, wow, I need to manage a lot of medication. Once one patient told me, I need to take 30 pills per day. So I really need to have notes about what time I need to take them. But this was not something that we are controlling in our study. And yes, our patients, they are immunosuppressed. So they are taking this type of medication. Um, so usually th this is one of the problems for weakness. They, they feel weaker. And one of the reasons maybe is the medication. That's why maybe after one year, they start saying they are getting stronger again because they're less medication and they feel more comfortable doing exercises. Yeah. So yeah. Maria, oh, yes. Right? Okay. Yeah. Perfect, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, the immunosuppression, yes, does affect muscle wasting. Yes, for sure. We, we can see it through the ultrasonography. We see the difference in our patient's muscle, definitely. And that actually links to a question I had um, kind of, well, th throughout really, and to someone who, who doesn't know about uh, sarcopenia, is uh, wondering whether it is kind of seen as in some instances it's like a, a symptom and in some instances it's like it's kind of categorized as a condition in, yeah. in itself so when uh, you originally started talking about how it was associated with other risks like graft loss for example um i was i, I was wondering you know whether um you know sarcopenia is the kind of condition which which has this uh, other negative effects but because you have less uh, muscle uh, mass which you know uh, in, in your body doing the things that the muscle does um, or that it, it's a reflection of underlying problems like Maria says you know if it's uh, immunosuppression which is uh, contributing to muscle wastage then in, in that view sarcopenia is the kind of like the the symptom or, or, or the outcome so is there that discussion or, or or debate or have I got it kind of totally wrong no, you got totally right. Okay. Uh, yes, a sarcopenia is a, a chronic disease that can be the disease by itself where the muscle is getting wasted, the muscle is becoming weaker and thin or with lots of no contractility fibers. So fat, uh, liquid, um, other tissues that don't help with the good contraction. But also because of sarcopenia, our patients can develop other diseases, uh, graphic loss, for example. Um, it's, it's hard to say that when our patients will be sarcopenic because we have many patients that go through the transplantation and still without sarcopenia. Something that we know is that the exercise can help improving the muscle quality, the muscle strength, uh, and for sure, we know that the medication, the immunosuppressor medication goes to the opposite, it helps with the transplant, but in the other uh, way, makes your muscle less, um, uh, 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 waste your muscle. So in terms of rehabilitation, what we can say is that the exercise or the quality of exercise uh, we do may will help these patients to reduce the level of sarcopenia or we will help our patients recover because sarcopenia can change cross timeline. So first this patient can have sarcopenia and then after a year, it can be without sarcopenia. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
Another question from Andy, who is a uh, double uh, lung uh, transplantee from 2018. Um, hope you're doing well, Andy. So is there a uh, link between immunosuppression and sarcopenia and fatigue? Yes, and frailty, I would say as well. They are all correlated. Um, we, we, we cannot say that the, the medication is playing the role to the sarcopenia. We know that is one component that necessarily it's not uh, in all our patients with sarcopenia because sarcopenia is not only um, a, a, a disease related to solid organ transplantation. But because of the weakness, our participants may will develop sarcopenia and fatigue. They will say they are tired, overtired. And it's common to hear between our patients the exhaustion. They feel exhausted. Uh, so yeah, definitely it exists. And especially exhaustion, I have noticed that still present 12 months after transplantation. Then we don't have many studies to tell if this is because of the lower level of physical activity or the higher level of medication. We, we don't know it yet, but what we can tell is that yes, it exists. Yeah, that makes sense. I imagine it's very difficult to kind of differentiate between all the different outcomes and, and, and variables. So I think it's a really, really well explained. Um, I was about to ask another one, but I'm being greedy here. So I'm gonna step back because Anders uh, has a question. Off you go, Anders. Yeah, f f thank you very much, Gareth and Manuela. Uh, I'm a little bit interested in, uh, I mean, right now you have presented uh, several studies on lung transplant recipients. So do you have any knowledge about other organ recipients like kidney, heart, liver, etc., or combinations? Amazing, Amazing and, question. And, 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 and how are they, you know, related to your studies here? Yes, so uh, in this study, we have lung, heart, liver, and kidney patients, but the lung group was the group that we could collect data collection like faster. So we had the first results based on them, and only the, the virtual assessment was is the study that we have results from all the other groups. But our preliminary analyses are showing that the liver, kidney, and heart patients are going in the same direction in terms of muscle quantity and muscle strength as the lung group. So we see uh, weaker patients at three months uh, after transplantation, and they improve their strength at 12 months after transplantation. But usually, the level of strength at 12 months after transplantation is still lower than at baseline. But it's something that can be changed. I think that that is a very important message. Sarcopenia or frailty can change across the time. And there are many factors that will interfere how it change. We see some patients that are not frail and then become frail or are not sarcopenic and then become sarcopenic and the opposite as well. Some patients like three months after transplant are much better than at baseline and they are much stronger. So it exists. And some of the components that can help, we know are exercises, nutrition, medication, lifestyle. Uh, how was this patient before transplant? How were their habits before transplant? Things like that. And other chronic diseases that eventually the patient has beyond the, 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 the disease that leads to the transplantation. Mm -hmm. So in the preliminary findings, would it be fair to say that it looks very similar across uh, organs or, or patients with different organs, basically? Yes, yes. Okay. It's speaking mm -hmm. about um, muscle strength mm -hmm. and muscle quality, yes. Okay, okay. Which is very interesting, I think, uh, because we can see other well transplant games that it looks like people are performing differently. I mean, depending on the organs, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense in some of the sports, but it makes a lot of sense in other types of sports, of course. So I was yeah. just interested in trying to, you know, understand more about those differences. Thank you. Thank you. 
And another one from Ben, lots of questions today. Um, this is kind of about how you define baseline. So when you had the kind of pre-transplant uh, measurement and then the kind of post-transplant three months, six months. So, uh, you know, did, did you take the baseline measurements kind of just before or is it while you're on the waiting list? Or how, how far before? Because I, I guess that would depend on you know, the level of the you know, severity of, uh, of illness and what experiences were like but before transplant so that's an interesting question yes it is so we uh, approached our participants um, between four to six weeks after they are being listed for the transplant but usually uh, at least in our center the lung transplant goes faster and sometimes kidney patients need to wait longer on the list and liver patients as well so knowing that, after this first baseline assessment, we did another assessment every six months. So let's say if our, our first baseline, our patient had to wait 24 months to get their transplant, we collected another um, four assessments and we use it for our data analysis. The last baseline assessment because of course, at that time, our patient probably changed their muscle composition. So it would, it would be fair to use the first baseline assessment, but that was a great question. And I hope I had answered it. Yeah. And then three months for all and 12 months after transplantation for all. Brilliant. Yeah, feel free to follow up, uh, Ben, if you have any other questions, but that sounds like you've answered it uh, spot on. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go because I'm dying for another question as well. Um, so uh, why, uh, wh while we still have you and we have a, a few minutes left, um, uh, I thought, well, a, a lot of your presentation is, of course, about the context uh, of, of, of sarcopenia and frailty. But actually, a lot of your kind of work and expertise seems to be in measurement, validation, you know, assessing which of the tools is better and all that kind of stuff. So I was wondering if that was applicable in... Or, or whether you could see it being applicable in, in other contexts. For example, um, thinking, bringing it back to the World Transplant Games, um, some some younger uh, transplant uh, recipients, younger than perhaps than, than the average are, are in your studies, um, are quite keen to get back to, to doing exercise, doing sport after th their transplant. And the current guidance is very, you know, vague, unsure. I, I remember a friend of mine saying uh, after ha having a kidney transplant, I think the doctor said to him, oh, you know, don't lift a, a kettle uh, in, in the first four weeks or something or uh, something like that. And it's kind of like, well, that's extremely vague as a, <laughs> as a test, so as a, you know, do a self test on, on picking a, a kettle up. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, if uh, imagine if if those patients had more sophisticated um, ideas of what the cutoff points could be, um, and whether these could be, you know, assessed remotely, whether there could be a kind of self-assessment on 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 how well you're doing in your return back back to uh, movement and the things that you, you love to do. Can you see any application and things like that? Yes, I see, and I love it. <laughs> And honestly, uh, our patients, they are very diverse because we are not, uh, we are diverse, right? So we have different levels of physical activity before and after transplant. And yes, some of our patients, they are ready to go after transplantation and they, they can't wait to go back to sports to do whatever they like. But I think we are behind actually as a physiotherapist we are too much conservative sometimes. I, I think we need to follow, the, for sure, we need to follow the guidelines. We need to be sure our patient is in a good moment to start lifting things again, starting exercise again. But we need also to improve our assessments. So we, we performed a study last year in, health, in healthy young population where we tried to use different um, functional tests. So for example, do the wall um, stand where the patient uh, sit on the wall and stay there for one minute or as long as they can. We did the one minute sit to stand test. 
they stand from the floor test and we were looking for the reliability of these tests because they are um, more complex and can be done for athletes, for example, or for our uh, lung uh, for our solid organ transplant recipients in the uh, early age or that still exercising. And we had a very good uh, reliability in this study. All the, all the participants, they could perform everything. We were able to see everything and no adverse events were observed. So yes, I think we, we need to be more creative in, in our assessments to assess the level of, of um, physical activity of our patients and the level of exercise from our patients to better prescribe the exercise that they need to do. Because eventually for some of them, for a runner, for example, maybe he will be able to start running uh, sooner than other person that never walked before transplant. But, but I think we sometimes as a physiotherapist, I feel we, we are not there. Our patients are going much further and faster than us. Yeah. That's yeah, I think that's a really good point and, and, a, and a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, being quite conservative and quite, quite uh, cautious. Um, where, where, where some people, particularly the people who are kind of engaged in the world transplant game stuff, probably know within themselves they they might be able to go a, a little bit faster on the rehabilitation yeah so yeah. for example uh, uh, months ago i was talking with a hard transplant recipient mm -hmm. and he was telling me well and then i went to the rehabilitation and we did and that was good and then they said okay now you can go back to your life and he was thinking okay but what can i do can i can i do whatever i want and he was like afraid without much guidance after his discharge. Then his nephew said, do you know what, uncle? I know you like to swim. So we will sign us for a three athlon and you will be the swimmer. And he starts swim to get a good score because that was the deal he did. He made with his nephew, right? But no physiotherapist, no chiropractor, no kinesiotherapist was involved. It was like a family decision. Let's do exercise. Let's make it. And why we are not thinking about it? Why? Yeah, yeah, really good point. And um, backed up as well by another comment. He, he totally agrees. Um, another lung transplant recipient. He'll be doing the Great North Run, which would be <laughs> incredibly impressive. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> I think we probably have one more one more question. So I think Anders, you're going to close it for us. Um, what, what have you got? Yeah, thank you very much again. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a kind of a follow-up question, or at least it's related. So I'm a little bit interested in, I mean, because what you are actually telling us is is that you know how much exercise you have done pre-transplant uh, has some kind of effects on the post-transplants. But what do we know more about that? And and that also relates to, I mean. Uh, more like longitudinal studies about exercise. I mean, both pre and post transplant. Yeah, well, it's yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, what, what what do we know about it, and and what kind of guidelines or advice could you give to perhaps the audience here, or 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 to other patients and 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 people and and so on involved in this this type of things? Amazing question. So yeah, we. We need more studies actually investigating long term the effects of lifestyle or exercise adherence before transplant and how it is related with clinical outcomes after transplantation. So it's it's not really clear what we are basing ourselves is the, on the knowledge that the exercise can change the muscle quality, the mus and the muscle strength especially but we don't know much how much the exercise or the exercise intensity uh, can interfere on the outcomes for all our patients but we know it is important so for example in our hospital our lung transplant patients once they are listed for the transplant they need to join to the rehabilitation program so they all start doing and i think at least it is good for 
for um, the physical activity level because they are increasing their physical activity level and maybe they will keep doing this exercise after transplantation. And this is other thing to think, how we are helping our patients with exercise adherence and how this adherence is changing their quality of life, their relationship with their bodies and things like that. But it's still uh, other topics that we need to understand better. So, thank you very much. And I think it was very interesting that you showed, you know, that the performance actually decreased after the transplantation, but you might at least at some point in time expect the opposite, right? Like you have some kind of positive effects. Yes. And, you know, it would be interesting to know when and where and why and, and so on. Yeah, yes. and in what type of patient groups or, or um, exercise groups or whatever, I guess you can, yeah, you can exercise in different ways. Yeah. And so on. So, yeah. It was no. just the background of, of the question. Yeah, no, that, that is a very good point. And actually, because we were doing the, the follow-up after transplantation with our patients, we had this idea because we saw that they were getting weaker three months after transplantation. And then many of them were getting stronger 12 months after transplantation. Mm -hmm. And we thought, oh my gosh, we, we need to see if the numbers are showing what we are seeing because our patients say, oh, well, now I, at three months, I feel weaker. And then 12 months, oh, now I feel better. Mm -hmm. But let's see the numbers as well, because for a publication, we need the numbers, right? And that's what the numbers are telling us. For this a preliminary uh, study, we were only able to include three months post-transplantation because we were still uh, collecting 12 months post-transplantation. But now that we have 12 months post-transplantation, we see that at 12 months, they are stronger than three months post-transplantation. Many of them is still not strong as the baseline, but there is no difference anymore between baseline and 12 months transplantation, which, which is good. And of course, we don't know after 12 months, but we see that it changed. The, the strength at least changed across the time between our patients. But of course, exercise is something that we need to measure the physical activity level with other things, medication, lifestyle, quality of life, depression. I think depression is a good component as well that plays the whole around the solar transplantation. So thank you very much. I think I hand over to Gary so, uh, Garrett so you can wrap up the, the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I guess it feels like we could uh, we could keep talking for a lot longer, but uh, I'll just uh, finish by, by saying thank you so much again, Manuela, for, for, uh, for coming today and giving us your time and your expertise. Um, a few comments coming in saying thank you as well. But I think the nicest one is from Liga, who says, amazing presentation, hugs from Brazil. So <laughs> nice to come well. in. Thank you um, very much. It was a pleasure for me to be here. Yeah, fantastic. thank you. And to everyone else, we'll be in touch about future talks. We'll have another one of these in, in two months' time. And we also have a kind of a forum a discussion group um, ongoing as well. So um, I'll send people an email. And Anders, Anders and I will send people an email um, to be in touch about that. But once again, thank you so much. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.